thank you for joining today's industry panel, take two. In every business, you reach a certain uh, inertia or growth plateau. And so you have to make a decision. Do I want to keep growing? Do I want to invest my time, my, my resources to, to keep growing my business? So it's a decision for the owners of the business. And um, you know, do you, do you seek that to, to accelerate growth? So let's assume you do. Once you decide you're going to invest in your business and commit to growth, the next question is how? We have three property management executives who've been running their business for a combined 40 plus years, a whole career's worth of learnings split into, into three. So um, quick introduction on who I am. I'm Mike Mosses. I'm the Senior Vice President of RealPage. I, I lead the Mixed Portfolio Business Unit. That includes building, property wear, uh, all property management, home wine stocks. I've been with RealPage approximately three years, but enough about me. Let, let's, let's talk to the folks that, that you really want to hear from to help figure out how to engineer your next growth phase. Could you describe the moment when you realized your business was plateauing and, and that you need to do things a little differently in order to grow? We started with Buildium when I first started consulting with properties. And at that point, there was a, you know, started small and built. And we got to a certain point where, thank God, I, I, and I believe it, I, that we had Buildium on our side because it made, enabled us to automate, to be able to service the clients. But at the same time, you need people inputting, you need people answering the phones. And we had to really look around and decide like, well, you know, in order to get to that next level, what do we need to do? So we needed to automate everything. You know, Buildium was our first platform to start on. And because of, um, you know, the partners involved, it's allowed us to really get to the next level. All right. Next question. I'll, um, I'm going to start with Nick here on this time. Um, since the pandemic, uh, the industry's faced challenges that continue to impact property managers. So you've got staffing shortages, housing shortages, you know, a lot of regulations being thrown at you. If you, if you had to pick one, What's the thing that you've come up against the most in the last year? Uh, that's a really easy question. Um, staffing, for sure. And we've gotten to the point where we're not looking for property managers to be property managers. We're looking for customer service people, um, waitresses, waiters, um, sale people, really anybody. <laughs> anybody with a good personality um, if we can support them properly, they can be a community property manager. Why is personality at the top of your list? You have to be able to deal with a board of directors and you have to be able to <laughs> walk into the fire, right? I think over the years we've decided, like I was saying before, we've taken some steps back to make sure to support people. So in that position, they are ready to deal with a potentially tough board of directors. Mark and Chris, I'm assuming staffing's at the top of your list as well. So yeah, I, I, you, I agree. Yeah, what do you do? What do, how do you find qualified candidates? What what are you looking for? Like what gives you what gives you a view that this is going to be a good candidate? Well, I, I honestly, uh, if you don't mind, Chris, I'll go first. It's just that um, you know we used to look for people that were you know knew something about construction or you know had some some kind of history in the field. And, uh, you know, that really didn't pan out well. You know, I, someone's got to be, you know, computer literate, technology savvy, and they've got to be problem solvers. You know, they've got to be, they got to be able to stay in the solution, not the problem. And also, as, as Nick was saying, you know, that, that personality thing with, with boards and your clients, remember, we're in the, we're in the customer service business. And you know, if you've got to know how to react to people, you got to know how to read them. You know, you've got to be able to know what the hot buttons are in order to service your client appropriately. Yeah, I'd agree. We have the hardest time trying to find folks that uh, have the decent attitude and want to keep going. And I know sometimes it gets rough, and there's always exchanges of ideas that are sometimes, uh, as we enforce the rules of a community, or things that are unpopular. So it's it's hard to have somebody who can deliver bad news nicely. Um, and like the running joke is we hire for your, uh, your attitude and that always determines your altitude. It's, it's real hard to get somebody with a bad look, you know, in no coffee yet, uh, just terrible demeanor. What do you want? And all of a sudden be nice on the phone or handle a problem. And especially when you're the 10th or 12th or 15th call that day, that is problematic. So that's what we look from our service partners is somebody who can put a smile on, take a deep breath and kind of have, okay. We're going to get through it. If you work with me, I'll be happy to work with you. Yeah, great point. All right, this one, this question, um, alert to the audience. We talked before we went live. 
And so I, I kind of know where, where they're going to go with some of the answers. And this is a very interesting one where everybody had a different take. So um, I'm going to throw it out to, to Mark and, and Nick, Chris, I know you guys can do fast follow up, but like what strategies for growth have consistently worked for your business? And I thought it was interesting. All three of you had a different angle. So Mark, do you mind uh, taking that first one? Um, strategy for growth is, you know, first of all, having, having the tools in place to work with, to grow. I always say that, you know, to grow to the size that we've gotten to, and believe me, we were up to 3000 units uh, just two months ago. And we're now down, I lost our largest client, which I think I mentioned to everybody was almost a thousand units. It was 30% of my, of my doors, but it was only 15% of my revenue. Once I realized it was only 50% of my revenue, I went, thank God. Okay. <laughs> you know, we can move on. Uh, but right now we're just settling. The dust is settling and we're getting ready for our next spurt of growth probably in, in the beginning of next year. But you've, you know, you've got to have all the tools, the technology and the team, that back office team in place and the managers. I mean, the, we, were, we were taking on properties one and two a month. And I, I, you know, my accounts, my, my back office people were saying, slow up, slow up in terms of integrating and, and managers and learning the properties. So um, that's, that's basically you know, setting the stage right. Yeah, I thought also, Mark, like speaking of settling dust, um, there was an element of talking about, you know, upselling on, on project management for construction renovations, which I thought was an interesting angle that you take. Listen, uh, you get into the condo co-op management, realize you're, you're, in, a, you're in, a, in an industry where the margins are slim to none, really. Um, you know, people, you know, the, the, the properties you're dealing with are not profit making businesses they're they're working on it's not profit and loss it's it's on you know deficits and surplus and the only way to keep that in check is to keep their common charges down so they may not go with you know they're going to go with the cheapest option 90 percent of the time no matter what services you are <laughs> what a great salesman you are you know it, it's crazy but however within my management agreement there is with projects of capital repairs over a certain dollar amount. And that dollar amount fluctuates based on the size of the of a property. The bigger the property, that bigger that threshold is where we can then become project coordinators because there's a lot more work entailed with it. And we negotiated with that. We negotiate usually on a percentage of the entire project. That could be a big lever. We, we're seeing again from, from the 23 industry report that renovations are rental owners' fourth highest source of stress. So as, as you're looking to grow your business, knowing that's what an owner is stressed out about and having some capability there, I think is, is a really uh, smart strategy. Nick, you had a, a, you had a unique angle on this as well, like setting a you know, strategy for growth and that's worked for your business. Yeah, so along the lines of what Chris was saying before, right? Networking has been really huge for us and with that it's networking with other management company owners we've been able to acquire several smaller companies and one um, medium-sized one um you know one thing actually in the short time since we've talked we for a, the longest time we wanted to get um, developer deals and we finally got one this week so this um, should add close to a thousand doors a year to our portfolio as long as we keep this developer happy and chris you, you know, when we were talking i think um, i think there's a sports raised addition by subtraction i think that was an interesting strategy you've had Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, depending on what category you're in, if you're one of those owners who doesn't take our advice consistently or just wants to go against the grain and not do uh, either some of the state law stuff or some of the, the best practice stuff, we're happy to shed that bottom 10% of our portfolio um, just to, uh, and I don't want to say call the herd, but you know, if you're not following directions, or you're not doing it right legally or ethically, we best uh, offer you the chance to become a better stranger and take that business to some <laughs> some other shop. Um, you know, we don't want to take on risky clients. We don't want to take on uh, not ethical or not uh, law abiding clients. So that certainly works for us. So shedding that bottom ten percent of our portfolio and making sure that the folks we are working with are always going to be good people in the end. We want to provide nice housing for nice people is the idea. Yeah, that's great. And then the same thing with our board members. If you know, I know board members turn over quite frequently, but uh, some days it's just hard to 
hard to go to a board meeting and have them outright contravene their own their own bylaws. So that may be a hard conversation to have, but you have to pull somebody aside and say, hey, if you didn't read, you know, part two or, you know, uh, the, the, the declaration of the the uh, the code of regs, that might not be a bad thing to do so that they don't become an obstacle to their own success. Makes a lot of sense. Um, pivoting. So another way to grow is obviously, uh, uh, you know, adding more services to the customers that you have today instead of finding additional customers. But that, that leaves the question of, do you hire and essentially take a service in-house or do you essentially resell a, a you know, a, another party's service, a third party service? So, you know, how, how do you decide which, which services to take in-house versus which, which services you, you leave to a third party? That's always been um, perplexing for me because I, I worked in, in the field before I had my own company. I worked for a property management company that had their own maintenance and landscape div, uh, division. It, it, it lent itself to a lot of what I felt collusion and always had to like cover my back. And I just never felt comfortable with it. Um, in, in my business, you know, I, I started off as we were all talking about, like it was an accident. I started off as a real estate agent, but I, re, you know, a, a licensed salesperson, but I wanted something that was guaranteed. That's why I got into property management and I excelled in it. And so what happens was as my business group with my property management, I also have a real estate brokerage division. So that's my ancillary service that I use to help increase my profit. Also have a, a Rolodex of, of qualified vendors that make us look good. Chris, any any perspective on in, in-house versus leaving to a third party for additional services? Yeah, I would second what Mark said. I think, you know, that that promotes a bit of competition and it doesn't allow us as an internal vendor the last word. So when I see a bid, I can't just slide in at the bottom um, or in my preferred space. Like some people in, in our communities will always take the second out of three or four bids. It's not the lowest, it's the one right before the lowest. Um, so that <laughs> that always helps to have that kind of just, hey, it's a closed envelope bid process and uh, it leaves us out of that. So it gives us uh, some things above reproach. To kind of go on what Chris and Mark had said a little bit, right? Like we don't make a lot of money on management fees. We, don't, we can't. And what we found here is that taking some of the construction stuff in-house really has been where we've started making money. Um, what that means is not taking on a lot of construction employees. Um, we basically have three project managers that um, project manage subbing out all these projects. In a sense, we end up doing anyways, but we've always strive to be super transparent that that's what we're doing. And um, to be honest, when we first started doing it, I didn't think anybody would go for it. I didn't think any boards would be okay with it. And almost every single one of them, they do not care. I, I can't believe it, but we're going with it. <laughs> <laughs> Is it be just because they, they, they have a working relationship with you and they just rather continue that and expand? That's a lot of it. And to be honest, over time, we realize people just want to get stuff done. Just get it done. Yeah, that's what we do. You've grown, you're growing your business, you're, you're starting to scale up. And it's the law of unintended consequences. So uh, you're scaling, what new challenge did you come across that you didn't expect? And then and how did you handle it? Yeah, for me, it was just, uh, you know, that I couldn't control everything. I couldn't, you know, I did, couldn't have a handle on everything. I had to delegate and let it go. And there was a lot of trial and error with that. Um, it was a learning process. But again, fitting the right people into the right job, into the right area, working together, developing that culture in our office, in our business uh, was help. Also, you know, and, 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 you know, assigning managers to the appropriate pro property when they would fit in, not one where they would clash. And sometimes, again, as, as uh, Nick and Chris have alluded to, you know, the personalities of boards, and <laughs> who's running the board, who's, you know, fitting the right person within it is, is also difficult. Yeah. It's a people business, right? Sounds like uh, that's what I'm hearing over and over again. Yeah.